do you know me and Jimmy Ivey ain't got into it? Because this motherfucker wanted me to be on the cover of the Rolling Stones. And I told him, fuck the Rolling Stones, nigga. I don't listen to them niggas. I want to be on the source, nigga. That's hip hop. He was like, no, Mike, you just don't understand. That's this big, and this magazine is international. I'm like, all right, nigga, fuck it, I'll do it. Had my hair in pigtails, put on some gangster shit. Took the picture with Dr. Dre, like on some niggas trying to tell me, look this way, nigga, fuck you, nigga. I'm looking this way. The shit came out, nigga, all the white American knew who I was. I had to call Jimmy and apologize. I said, damn, Jimmy, you know your shit. The Source Magazine, every nigga in the world knew me. But when the Rolling Stones came out, well, all whitey then. <laughs> Man, ain't no in-betweens to it. I mean, they was knowing me everywhere. It was like, hey, Snoop, huh? I never heard my name called like that. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Cause I was Snoop Doggy Dog, and my style was imperative to everything that I was doing as far as my rap style, my look, my, my whole style in general. So it, it was it was dope because it gave you a, a X-rated feel, but at the same time, it was just me in general. And it opened some criticism on how could he have an album cover that looks like this, and there's a woman bent over, and it's, it's referring to sex and its sexual content inside of it. It was just me being, me being me, you know what I'm saying? I grew up listening to Richard Pryor records, Rudy Ray Moore, Red Fox, like finding old kind of records that my mom and them had up under the record player, listening to them and, and hearing all of that, you know, funny stuff that they were saying and, you know, implementing it into my project. I just wanted to be the dopest MC in the world. <laughs> That's all I was pushing for at the time. Um, and Dr. Dre had a vision because he, he had got a chance to hang out with me and by hanging out with me, he had learned who I was. And he knew I was into a lot of 70s and old school black exploitation. And when we would ride together, I would always have a cassette with old school songs on it. And I would always control the music from the passenger seat. So he started to figure me out while we was working on The Chronic. That's what people don't understand. Like, I still was enjoying The Chronic. Like, remember, I didn't have no money. I wasn't a star. I was, I was a regular nigga. So The Chronic, nigga, I was like a star. Like, I'm cool with this. I don't want to pressure of an album when I could just live off of Dr. Dre being his background, letting him be the foreground. Now I gotta be the foreground. Uh-oh. It's all on me? The whole weight? I gotta be in front of cameras? Remember, I'm shy. So, in the beginning, I don't know how to talk. I don't know how to look in cameras. I'm like, the camera right here, I'm over here talking like this. Like, I'm not made for this. And once we got past the initial shock, it was like, all right, I gotta I, I can't be weak around him. I don't want him to say none of my rhymes is weak. I want him to always say my rhymes is dope. And then he had DLC with him, which was like the God. You know what I'm saying? So it was like, it ain't about what Dre like, it's about what DLC like. Cause DLC was his ear. You know, cause he was writing most of the NWA material once Cube left or whatnot. So he was like Dre's, you know, trusty ear. So when I came in, I had to impress Dre and the DLC. So by the time we got to Doggy Style, it was more about I know what this dude is about. I know what this album should be about. It should be some pimp, extraordinary, fly, dope rap, hardcore, uh, melodic, like all the, everything that's on Doggy Style, I believe that Dr. Dre had the ingredients and knew how to prepare it. I just was some of the, you know, the meat and potatoes and the, you know what I'm saying? The, the, the portion of the meal that was there, but was unprepared and he prepared it and served it to people like never before. I think it made it cool for white people to listen to rap. And I'm just being point blank about it. Like, they was listening to rap back then, but they weren't listening to no real niggas. NWA scared them. You know what I'm saying? But Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre made it okay. It was okay to say nothing but a G thing. And, you know what I'm saying? We had them on a, on a feeling like it's okay as opposed to this ain't for you. Despite many whites bought NWA and all that, they couldn't say it though. They had to buy them records and shut up. And like, I'm really not listening to this, but I'm a fan. When our shit came out, they was like, all right, we letting everybody know this is the shit we wooded. White America loves and MTV jumped on it. It was it was hot everywhere. So it was like, it was acceptable. So it broke the, the barrier as far as like 
everybody can listen to this. You don't have to be secretive about it. You know what I'm saying? You don't have to hide and listen to this. You can listen to this around everybody. And no one's going to judge you. Everyone's going to say, you're cool. You're actually going to be uncool if you're not listening to Snoop Dogg. I was a quarterback when I first came in, but I just didn't know how to run the offense. I just ran plays, and if I scored, I scored, and I was happy. But as I became a, a better quarterback, I became calculated with knowing what I wanted to do, moving the ball up the field, and the plays I wanted to make, and the career moves, you know what I'm saying, in control, as opposed to being told what to do, but driving my career. Like in the beginning, I was told, you can't do a song with him, you can't do this, you should do this, you should do this, do this. Now it's like, I ain't doing that, I'm doing what I want to do, shut up. I can't die, my boo-boo's about to have my baby. Dear God, I wonder, can you save me? Remember those lines on Doggy Style? I was talking to God on Doggy Style. See, that's what people fail to realize. They thought I just met him last year. No, I've been talking to him. I talked to him before the murder case. I didn't even have a murder case when that song was written. I wrote that song and then I caught a murder case. But good thing I brought God with me because he brought me through. The pen is mightier than the sword. You know what I'm saying? I've seen a lot of rappers write their death in my era. So my pen became more, I'm going to live my life. Let me have fun. Let me live a little bit. I'm going to wake up tomorrow. And then my life became that as well. You have to learn how to live what you write. Because we wrote so much reality that we began to write what was going to happen. We wrote the future. Like, our pen was that good. Like, you could write happiness too. Just don't be afraid. And I took the chance on writing about happiness and love and beautiful and, you know, great things in life and connecting with people who had different spirits who wanted to live and not niggas that just wanted to die. I think it's my mother. My mother raised me to love people and to be respectable and to put out the energy that you get back. And I've always had a connection to the youth. I've always stayed in tune with them. I never tried to step on their toes or, or bash them. I've always been like a uncle, so to speak. That's why they call me Uncle Snoop, because I've been a, a, a shoulder to cry on, an ear to hear, uh, someone to step in when they have misunderstandings. I've been that bigger brother that the hip hop industry never had. And I take it on, you know. I don't, I'm not saying that the hip hop industry never had. I just feel like I'm doing something that I would have never been doing 25 years ago. Like I was in the middle of beef. Now I'm in the middle of peace. Because uh, we had our heart and souls in it. We were passionate about that project. We wanted that project to be everything that it is. But we didn't go into it thinking that. We just, that's the work ethic. The work ethic was, we worked at it like professionals, as you know, professional athletes, entertainers, or actors. We worked at it like that to where nothing could stop it from being great, no matter what people said. In our minds, it was great. When we made it, we knew it was great. So confirmation was just people buying it, loving it, and 25 years later, it's still being talked about. Let my work speak when I think about the greats like Marvin Gaye and, you know, Teddy Pendergrass, Luther Vandross, Ray Charles, and Curtis Mayfield. I think about their music. I think about their legacy. I think about what they did, what they personified. I think about Muhammad Ali and what he meant outside of the ring and how he was the greatest of all time. I told my son, I said, nigga, Muhammad Ali was the greatest nigga to ever live. And you had the privilege to meet him. You should be honored, man. That was one of the greatest to ever do it. He was a nigga when you couldn't be one. You understand what I'm saying? And that is what it is. So to be able to walk with greatness and be around people that are great and then to be associated with greatness and become great, it's a blessing. But you got to always remember that it's somebody looking up at you, so never be too big to give some advice or some information. I would tell him to walk instead of run because he'll enjoy the ride more if he walks. If he runs, he won't enjoy it. Just walk, because that's what I do now, I walk. The old Snoop was running, he was running. And it looked like I'm running now because I do so much, but I'm actually walking. And that's the difference that I wasn't even doing as much back then and I was running and ripping. And now I'm doing the most and I'm just walking because I'm letting it all come to me instead of me trying to go find it.